let's talk about other types of hepatitis. So one example is your toxic and drug-induced hepatitis. So your toxic and drug-induced hepatitis at initial stages would resemble your viral hepatitis at onset. So your patient would have the generalized flu-like symptoms. Okay? So drug-induced hepatitis or drug-induced cholestasis would lead to hepatitis T. Now, what is drug-induced cholestasis? When I say drug-induced cholestasis, that is the st stasis of your bile inside your gallbladder okay, because of drugs. So what if the bile stays in the gallbladder? Okay? Bile staying in the gallbladder would mean increased risk for the formation of your cholelithiasis, the development of your stones. And then once there is stones, there will be a possible risk for obstruction. Once there is obstruction, there will be increase of bile. And where will the bile be going? Okay, the bile will be going towards the liver. And because of that, autolysis may occur, damage to the liver would ensue. So, this causes liver alteration by initiating either drug-induced hepatitis or drug-induced cholestasis. And liver necrosis would occur within two to three days after acute exposure to dose-related hepatotoxins. Okay, meaning if you're exposed to a very high dose of hepatotoxic substances, within two to three days, liver necrosis would ensue. Okay, your liver will not be able to function and not able to recover. Now, what are the assessment findings? Anorexia, nausea, vomit, jaundice, and hepatomegaly. As you can notice, okay, the signs and symptoms are just the same and congruent to that of viral hepatitis. But our key here for the recovery of your patient is to identify the hepatotoxin early and remove it. If we're talking about the medication, discontinue the medication. Because the prolonged or the longer the period is between the exposure and the onset of symptoms, the recovery is already becoming unlikely. Okay, antidotes is less likely to be used in this case. Then we have the term fulminant hepatic failure. So when I say fulminant hepatic failure, this refers to clinical syndrome of sudden and severely impaired liver function. Okay, so once you have considered that there is an impairment of liver function, one thing that you might consider is the presence of your hepatitis. Other than that, you will consider your toxic hepatitis or drug-induced hepatitis. Okay. Other than that, if your patient had a sudden and severely impaired liver function without any other known cause, okay, you would suspect the development of your fulminant hepatic failure. Okay. The failure develops within eight weeks after the first symptom of jaundice. Okay. After the first symptom of jaundice. There are three categories for your fulminant hepatic failure. And the three categories are usually differentiated by the number of days between the onset of jaundice to the onset of encephalopathy. So again, when I say encephalopathy, that is the occurrence of your neurologic signs and symptoms because of the excess waste products in our body. So it's referred to as hyperacute if within seven days, patient is already having incept. Acute if 8 to 28 days and subacute if 28 days to 72. Okay, so hyperacute, acute, and subacute. Your fulminant hepatic failure is considered to be worse compared to your chronic liver failure. Okay, again, later on we will see chronic liver failure. So fulminant hepatic failure is considered to be worse compared to your chronic liver failure. However, if detected early, your fulminant hepatic failure is tend, tend to be reversible. It tends to be reversible compared to your chronic liver failure. Then causes of your fulminant uh, failure. You have viral hepatitis, toxic medications. One example is your acetaminophen. Okay, chemicals, carbon tetrachloride is common. Then you have your metabolic disturbances, for example, your Wilson disease. So your Wilson disease is a hereditary syndrome with the position of copper in the, in the liver. Okay, so copper deposits in the liver. And then for your structural changes, you have your bad shari syndrome. So your bad shari syndrome is an obstruction to the outflow in the major hepatic vein. Okay, there is an obstruction to the outflow in the major hepatic vein. So what are the consequences of your fulminant hepatic failure? One is your coagulation defects. So the risk for bleeding. That's why you need to assess your patient for bleeding gums, 
bruising, okay? And then presence of other signs of bleeding, such as spermelina, hematokisha, hematemesis. Then your patient would also have kidney disease. Okay, so for your kidney disease, you need to watch out for your creatinine. You also need to watch out for your BUN. Electrolyte disturbances. Due to the combination of liver and kidney problems, your patient will have problems with sodium and potassium imbalances. Then you have your cardiovascular abnormalities, secondary also to fluid and electrolyte problems. For infection, okay, other than the presence of your hepatitis itself, which is in this case more of an inflammatory process, your patient's immune system may also be impaired in such a way that infection, other types of infection may occur. So closely monitor for the temperature of the patient. Hypoglycemia. One possible cause for this is the inability of the liver already to perform your glycogenolysis. Okay, so glycogenolysis is the breakdown of your glycogen to glucose. So with that failure of the body to use your glycogen supplies, okay, hypoglycemia may ensue. Then you have your encephalopathy. One way for you to detect encephalopathy early is to ensure regular assessment of the level of consciousness of the patient. Any sign of irritability must be reported to the healthcare provider right away. Okay, then you have your cerebral edema. So for this one, again, the level of consciousness of your patient. Okay, so this is what will happen if your fulminant hepatic failure will not be addressed right away. So what are the management? Usually, these patients are placed in the intensive care unit. If the cause of the problem is your n acetylcysteine okay, or your acetaminophen, I mean, which is hepatotoxic, we give your n acetylcysteine as an antidote. Okay, if we're talking about mushroom poisoning, there are species of mushroom which is uh, toxic to the liver. So, penicillin is the drug of choice for that. And then, plasma exchanges could be done. So your plasma exchange is expected to address your coagulopathy, also to reduce your serum ammonia levels and to stabilize the patient while awaiting liver transplantation. So when I say plasma therapy or plasma exchanges or plasma pheresis, okay, your uh, a shunt or a tubing is inserted towards your blood vessel, a major blood vessel, and then the blood is being drawn out from the body, it will pass through the machine that allows to separate your plasma from the solid components of the blood. And then later on, that blood will be returned towards the body. So it's as if that the plasma is already cleaned of impurities. So example of which is your ammonia. Okay? Then you have your prostaglandin therapy, which is known to improve the blood flow in cases of hepatic failure. Then other management options, we have your ELAD or your ELAD, and then you have your BAL. So your extracorporeal liver assist devices. So the whole blood okay, are being expressed towards the cartridges, which contains human hepatoblastoma cells, okay, resulting in removal of toxic substances. So your ELAD is, works just like the principle of your dialysis. If the liver is not functioning, okay, there is a machine that is able to act as your liver. And then in that case, that is your ELAD. Okay, another is your BAL. Your BAL, bio-artificial liver. Okay, take note, bio-artificial liver. So this comes from uh, porcine liver cells. So the device is exposed, exposed as separated plasma to a cartridge which contains your porcine liver cells after the plasma has flowed through a charcoal column that removes substances toxic to hepatocytes. So I would want you to emphasize on the type of cells being used Okay, like in your ELAD, it will be your human. And then for your BAL, you are using that from the animals. And then the goal of these two is to remove the substances toxic to the liver or your hepatocytes. Let's talk about chronic hepatitis. So in your chronic hepatitis, this is liver inflammation that continues for three to six months. Okay, three to six months. You have the term chronic persistent hepatitis. So this is benign or seldom progressive. Okay, and then this commonly occurs among males. And then the signs and symptoms are the same as your acute okay, viral hepatitis. So for your chronic persistent hepatitis, okay, it's persistent. That's why it's a benign and usually it's seldom progressive. So assessment findings. You have slight enlargement and tenderness of the liver. Upper or RUQ, right upper quadrant discomfort. And still your nausea, anorexia, and weakness. 
then you have your chronic active hepatitis or your CAH. So this is a more severe illness leading to hepatic inflammation, hepatic necrosis, and even your progressive fibrosis. So it's more severe inflammation, necrosis, and fibrosis. Now, assessment findings. If you would look at it, it's the more severe form of the findings that we had okay, on the other types of hepatitis. Look at that, deep jaundice. Then you'll have hemolytic anemia. Then bleeding tendencies for this patient. Okay. Liver necrosis. Enlargement of your liver, enlargement of your spleen. That's because of a lot of uh, a lot of breakdown of your RBCs, which are processed in your liver and your spleen. And then you'll have abdominal pain, amenorrhea for girls, and then you have your ascites and arthritis. Medications. For these patients with CAH, steroids, intravenous steroids are given. Supportive therapy is bed rest. And then uh, they are good candidates supposedly for liver transplantation. Now, alcoholic hepatitis. As the term implies, this came from or induced by presence of alcohol. So in your alcoholic hepatitis, there is inflammation of the liver caused by parenchymal necrosis resulting from the heavy ingestion of alcohol. So this is the common case among your alcoholics. Signs and symptoms would be the same. Okay, take note of the elevated serum bilirubin. Okay, which is common in among any patients who manifest with jaundice. Then you have your encephalopathy. Management, still bed rest. Okay, uh, increased carbohydrate if patient is conscious, fully awake. Increased calorie in the diet. Increased vitamins. Usually vitamin B is given for this patient. Okay, folic acid supplements. Then parenteral fluids to dilute the blood. And then steroids are also given. Now, the next topic will be your hepatic cirrhosis, which will be discussed on the next recorded lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.